Good morning, and thank you for joining us for another program in the museum's Facebook Live series. I'm your host, historian Edna Friedberg. During each episode, we discuss Holocaust history and its relevance in our world today. Months ago, we planned this program about the pursuit of justice after the Holocaust. In light of yesterday's verdict in the murder of George Floyd, it feels particularly timely and meaningful. The Holocaust and longstanding American racism are painful and distinct histories with which we continue to grapple. In both instances, individuals and organizations have worked to achieve some measure of justice for victims targeted because of who they are. We hope that this conversation can shed light on the causes of hatred and the manifest forms of justice in its aftermath. Today, we will speak with a former Nazi hunter to learn about efforts to prosecute perpetrators of crimes committed during the Holocaust and to compensate survivors and their families decades after the war ended. I am pleased to be joined by my colleague, museum historian, Dr. Elizabeth White. She has almost 30 years of experience preparing cases to prosecute and remove from the United States perpetrators of Nazi crimes. Hi there, Barry. Good morning, Edna. It's nice to see you. Same here. During today's program, please send us your questions for Barry by posting them in the comment section and we'll get to as many of them possible live as we have time for. Barry, let's begin by setting the stage. Although some prominent leaders of Nazi Germany were prosecuted for their crimes in the immediate aftermath of the war, why were so many others able to evade the law? Well, yes, thousands of Nazi officials and collaborators were tried in courts throughout Europe immediately after the war. But for the most part, the focus of those trials had not been on the crimes of the Holocaust. So for example, we have an image here from the most famous trial of 22 top German leaders. Uh, but that focus of that trial was on the Germans' guilt for waging an aggressive war in which they committed mass war crimes against many groups of victims. Important information about the Holocaust came out in the trial, such as the mass killing with poison gas of Jews in places like Auschwitz, and the estimate of six million Jewish victims. So people who followed the trials understood that um, the Germany had treated the Jews very, very badly, but there was still a tendency to see the Jews as one of many victims of Nazi Germany and not really to understand the uniquely evil treatment that the Germans meted out to the Jews. And so since little information came out at this time in these trials, especially about the lower level perpetrators of Holocaust crimes, many, many, many of them were able to avoid detection. And indeed what we um, most commonly refer to as the Nuremberg trials, it was um, a series of trials and they were military tribunals. So these are pointedly war crimes trials, not Holocaust trials. Mm -hmm. Um, could you explain then how the mood of the international community began to change? There was sort of a flurry of prosecutions, uh, some local, some international right after the war, but that then also affected efforts to bring uh, Nazis and their collaborators to justice. What happened? Well, by 1948, uh, relations between the Soviet Union and its former allies, the US, Britain, and France had soured to such extent that there was real fear that World War III was about to break out. This was the start of that four decade era that's known as the Cold War. And in that climate at that time, people on both sides just lost interest in bringing the criminals of World War II to justice. So trials almost completely stopped. And a decade later, pretty much everybody had been convicted but not executed was set free. Um, and this was especially true for the perpetrators of Holocaust crimes, because after all, most of the murders of the Holocaust happened in countries that during the Cold War were behind the Iron Curtain. So much of the documentation about the crimes was there behind the Iron Curtain, seized by those communist 
countries and stashed away in archives that only communist security officials could access for the duration of the Cold War. Um, so this, you know, it's sometimes said that um, Nazi war criminals were about the only group of people to benefit from the Cold War. This was especially the case for the perpetrators of Holocaust crimes, uh, and especially uh, for those non-German perpetrators who were able to flee to the West, because there, there was not clear understanding of the extent to which non-German collaborators had actually participated in the persecution and the murder of Nazi Germany's Jewish victims. And so then it was easy for these people when they got to the West to lie about what they had done during the war since the truth was locked away and to get visas to resettle and start new lives in new countries, including the United States. I'm going to pause for a moment to take a moment and acknowledge, welcome our viewers who are watching from all around the country and all around the world. Uh, good morning, very early good morning. Thank you for joining us from San Diego, California. Uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, Salem, Massachusetts, Bemidji, Minnesota, Laplace, Louisiana, Cary, North Carolina, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and also good morning to you in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And to our international viewers, welcome to you tuning in from Bogota, Colombia, London in the UK, Toronto, Canada. Hello to you in Brazil, and also good afternoon to you in Israel. So Raim Tovin. Uh, now, Barry, some of our viewers may be familiar with the 2018 feature film, Operation Finale, which is the true story of the abduction and trial of uh, leading Nazi perpetrator Adolf Eichmann. This month marks, <clears throat> excuse me, the 60th anniversary of the Eichmann trial. Could you please tell us about the crimes that he committed, his centrality to the implementation of the Holocaust, and how he was eventually um, brought to court? Well, uh, Adolf Eichmann was one of the major managers of the Final Solution, that Nazi program to wipe out the Jews in Europe. Uh, you can see him in this photo. He is in the uniform of an SS major. And so, for example, he personally organized the deportation of about one and a half million Jews from Germany, Western, Southern, and Northern, Europe to ghettos and to killing sites such as Auschwitz. Uh, at the, after the war, he was actually arrested, but he managed to escape. He fled south to Italy, got a false identity, and used it to get a visa to go to Argentina. I think we have a photo, an image here of an Argentine visa with his false identity and his photo. So once he was in Argentina, he was able to bring over his family and to lead a pretty comfortable existence until 1960, when Israeli intelligence agents kidnapped him and took him to Israel to stand trial. And Barry, there's an audience question. Um, a gentleman mm -hmm. named Joel is asking uh, how long it was. When did Israel find out that Eichmann was alive and for how long? And um, how long was the discussion about going after him? Do you know that? Uh, I think Israel found out uh, from a German prosecutor, Fritz Bauer, around 1958. So it was a couple of years in the making. Um, also want to mention that um, in assuming this new identity as Ricardo Clement and getting there, uh, Eichmann did not only act alone. He evaded punishment with help from some figures in the Catholic Church and others. So uh, there, it's not just a question of one man uh, looking over his shoulder. Now, uh, the Eichmann trial, his capture and his standing trial in the very newly created Jewish state was a, a major moment, not only for the state of Israel, but for people around the world who were able to watch it. This uh, trial was filmed and portions of it were televised globally. Uh, let's listen to powerful words from Gideon Hausner. He was the lead prosecutor at Eichmann's trial and here in his opening statement is setting the tone for the symbolism as well as the practical implications of these proceedings. When I stand before you, judges of Israel, in this court to accuse Adolf Eichmann, I do not stand alone. 
Here with me at this moment stand six million prosecutors. But alas, they cannot rise to level the finger of accusation in the direction of the glass dock and cry out j'accuse against the man who sits there because their ashes have been piled up in the mounds of Auschwitz and the fields of Treblinka or spilled into the rivers of Poland and their graves are scattered throughout the length and breadth of Europe. Their blood cries to heaven, but their voice cannot be heard. Very powerful words indeed, and um, with a lot of resonance uh, for people who are watching that they would have gotten. A lot of biblical references in the Hebrew, even the use of the phrase jacuz um, is a direct reference back to the anti-Semitic trial of um, Albert Dreyfus uh, in France at the end of the 19th century. So Hausner framing this in terms of Jewish history, uh, Jewish hatred in a very, uh, very deliberate way. Barry, tell us how, with this filming, the trial captured global attention and revived international interest in uh, pursuing Nazi perpetrators some 14, 15 years after the end of the Holocaust. Well, yes, uh, Eichmann's abduction and then the trial, they, they were an international sensation, avidly covered uh, by press all around the world. I think, yes, here's a, an image of a headline from the New York Times article about the trial. But more than that, it was recorded and then broadcast on television, on radio. So for example, in the United States, people would see clips of the trial and hear daily recaps on their nightly news. And uh, what particularly riveted people was the testimony by survivors, about a hundred of them, who wrenchingly described what they suffered um, and what they lost, and many of them, how they resisted. Uh, and uh, this really drove home for people the vast scope and the uniqueness of Nazi crimes against the Jews. This is actually when the term Holocaust became the generally recognized term for the Nazi genocide of the Jews. It had not been commonly used that way before. And although this trial was not the, the first time that Holocaust survivors had appeared in a courtroom, um, they took center stage and with a drama that was unprecedented. We see here from left to right survivors, Dr. Martin Poldy, a woman named Esther Goldstein, and Abba Kovner on the right with his arm in the air. Um, Abba Kovner, a very well-known um, leader of the uh, armed resistance in the Vilna Ghetto in Lithuania. Um, so really people speaking both about their experience as witnesses, but also giving voice uh, to, the, to the loss and the anger um, that was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a comment from a viewer named Andrea writing about Holocaust survivors who testified at the Eichmann trial, specifically about a woman named Sivia Lubetkin, saying that she was an amazing woman, not only courageous and heroic as a fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto, but also for having the courage and strength to testify so many years later. She calls her a true heroine in every sense of the word and absolutely there. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, Eichmann himself, how he was seated in the trial, Barry? Well, he was, um, he stood to testify inside a glass booth to protect him from assassination attempts. And, you know, people expected that someone who could do the kinds of things that Eichmann was accused of must be a monster. So it was almost disappointing to see him as he came across as this kind of petty bureaucrat, very drab, dispassionately testifying that yes, there was a final solution program and millions of Jews were killed, but he was just a little cog in the machinery doing as he was instructed and shouldn't be held responsible. So he admitted helping to murder millions of Jews, but said that he felt no guilt. The judges uh, disagreed uh, and 
found him that he found that he was a major perpetrator of the Holocaust. They convicted him, sentenced him to death, and in 1962, he was executed. He's still, to this day, the only person in the state of Israel has condemned to death and executed. Now, just a few years after the Eichmann trial, Americans became um, more aware of the Holocaust, you could say, in a way that hit close to home when they learned that some Nazi criminals were living in their midst here in the United States. Please tell us a bit about someone who was then known to her neighbors as Mrs. Ryan. Yes, uh, Hermina Ryan uh, immigrated to the United States in 1958. You can see her visa photo here. Uh, after she married American citizen Russell Ryan, and in 1963, she became a U.S. citizen. The Ryans settled in a neighborhood in Queens, New York, where she was well-liked and particularly admired for her skills as a housewife. She kept an immaculate home. So, for example, uh, when a boy hit a baseball through her window, she refused to take payment for it and instead fed him some of her delicious pancakes with sugar. So it was quite a shock for her neighbors in 1964 when the New York Times revealed that during World War II, she had been an SS woman guard at Ravensbrück and Majdanek concentration camps. She had been born, Hermina Braunsteiner, grew in Vienna, grew up in Austria, but then when Austria was taken over by Nazi Germany in 1938, she moved to Berlin and there volunteered to become an SS overseer of uh, the women's concentration camp, Ravensbrück. Then in 1942, she transferred to Majdanek concentration camp and became a deputy overseer, a deputy leader of the women's camp there. It was at Majdanek that prisoners nicknamed her the stomping mare because of her habit of savagely kicking women prisoners with steel-toed boots. After the war, she went back to Austria and was arrested and tried for crimes at Ravensbrück, convicted but very quickly released. And then later in the 50s, it was in Austria that she met and married Russell Ryan. We have an audience question, Barry. Uh, Richard from Salem, Oregon is asking, why was Braunsteiner allowed into the country at all? Certainly the Nazis kept a record of who they hired for the death machines. If nothing else, they kept meticulous records of their atrocities. Can you shed light on that? Well, uh, Hermina Braunsteiner emigrated as um, the spouse of an American citizen. So she, she didn't come in under the immigration programs that most Nazi perpetrators entered under. And she never under, had, didn't have to go up through that kind of a background check. I'm not sure how much documentation survived the war about her service that would have been readily available to uh, immigration inspectors. But she did indeed have a post-war criminal record for it in Austria. So it seems she yes. was yes. shielded she, by her, her, her spousal privilege. Yes, and she, she did not reveal that, which then uh, became the basis of the U.S. case against her. So what then did happen after her, her dark past and uh, her misdeeds had become public? Well, supposedly when the New York Times reporter knocked on her door and asked her about her concentration camp service, she said, my God, I knew this would happen, you've come. And so the US moved to strip her of her citizenship because the United States can't try Nazi persecution who come here for their crimes because crimes committed in Europe during World War II don't fall under the jurisdiction of U.S. courts. So the most the government can do is to strip citizenship and then deport people who participated in Nazi crimes. Uh, she was stripped of her citizenship in 1971, and then West Germany asked to extradite her to stand trial for crimes at Majdanek. At the extradition hearings, former prisoners testified to how she brutally whipped and stomped on prisoners, killing some of them, and also grabbed Jewish children, kicking and screaming from their wailing mothers and sent them to the gas chambers at Majdanek. So she was 
extradited in 1975 at age 53, the first U.S. resident to be extradited for war crimes. And then she was convicted in Germany of murder and sentenced to life in prison. That was not until, what, almost 20 years, 18 years after her past was first um, uncovered. And I want to point this out because I think not only are the, the wheels of justice um, meticulous, but they therefore also have to be slow. You know, it's not something with immediate results. What about her husband? She's married to this American man. Um, how did he react to learning about her past if he had not known it before? Supposed, supposedly he didn't know before, but when the truth came out, he made re, remained steadfastly loyal. He said she was the nicest person in the world, couldn't possibly have done these terrible things. And he moved to Germany to be near her while she was in prison and, and was at her side when she died. So with this turning point, uh, the precedent set by Hermina Braunstein or Ryan and her extradition, what actions then began to, to take, were taken to hunt down other Nazis and collaborators who were living in the United States? Well, the extradition hearings created quite a sensation and the press started digging up more and more stories about other Nazi war criminals who were living in the United States. And this caused a public outcry about the government's failure to pursue them. Um, the government had tried uh, in a few cases, but its record was really dismal. Before Ryan, it had only succeeded in deporting one Nazi perpetrator. So in 1978, Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman persuaded Congress to pass an amendment to the immigration laws that provides that anyone who participated in Nazi persecution cannot enter or legally reside in the United States. And then she also persuaded the Justice Department to concentrate all of the responsibilities for Nazi cases in a single office. In 1979, the Attorney General created the Office of Special Investigations, known as OSI, and assigned it the mission of investigating, uh, detecting, investigating, and bringing legal action to remove persons who participated in Nazi persecution and also to prevent some, such persons from entering the United States. Uh, I will tell you as a kind of humorous side note, this didn't come up in rehearsal, but that about 10 years ago, I was sponsoring my husband to become a, a legal permanent resident, a green card holder here in the US. And he also had to answer and swear under oath that he had not been a member of the Nazi party or an assistant assisted in any way. Those questions are still there. Um, the humorous part is that he was born in 1965, but it's just it's the standard part, it's codified. So. Yes. So this newly created uh, division or office in the Department of Justice, OSI, um, you joined it not long after it started, um, and therefore you know firsthand what goes into one of their investigations. Could you let us in a little bit on the behind the scenes and what it takes, one in particular, the case of a man named Alexandras Lelakis? Yes, Lelakis. I think we have image some photos of him. Yes, there. Um, so on the left, that's before World War II when he was a, a Lithuanian police officer, and then 1976 when he obtained U.S. citizenship. Um, so during the war, Lelakis had been the chief of the Vilnius. Uh, security, the Lithuanian security police in German-occupied Vilnius. And he'd been a desk murderer. He had ordered the execution of probably hundreds of Jews. As the war was ending, he fled westward, ended up in Western Germany, at, and actually came under investigation by the U.S. Army when it received the allegation that as the chief of the Lithuanian security police, he might have been involved in shootings of Jews. But nothing was really known, uh, especially in the West, about the Lithuanian security police, what its duties were. So there was no way to contradict Little Agus when he claimed that he had nothing to do with Jews. His job had been to investigate communists. And that claim got the interest of the CIA, which employed him as a low-level informant for a couple of years in Germany. 
Then in 1955, he managed to immigrate to the United States and he settled in Norwood, Massachusetts. In around 1982, OSI came across the information that Lilakis had been the chief of the Lithuanian security police in Vilnius. And it tried to investigate him, but still very little was known about what that organization had done. And so without access to its records in Lithuania, which was then controlled by the Soviet Union, there was no way for OSI to prove that Lilakis had participated in Nazi persecution. But we certainly um, would have had our suspicions of what his participation might have been and the types of killings were documented. Um, there were um, tens of thousands of Lithuanian Jews who were shot in um, mass murder operations, um, particularly in the Ponari forest uh, yes. near, near the city of Vilnius. And we have here a photo of that. Um, mm -hmm. There would be small numbers of Germans there and also um, what were known as Lithuanian special action squads, um, auxiliary uh, troops who would uh, help yeah, actually, they did most of the shooting. Now, timing was everything in this case. Um, the Iron Curtain, as you had mentioned earlier, uh, was um, making it impossible to access certain records and so therefore offered protection, a measure of protection for decades to people like Lilakis. How did the end of the Cold War change the outcome of OSI's pursuit of this perpetrator? Well, uh, you know, OSI did win a number of cases in the 80s, but its investigations were seriously hampered against people like Cloacus because of access to the archives behind the Iron Curtain. And so when the Iron Curtain started to fall, OSI saw a great opportunity to deploy its historians to archives there, and they found troves of information about Nazi crimes, Holocaust crimes, and their perpetrators. So in the case of Lilakis, an OSI historian found the records of the Lithuanian security police in Vilnius and of the central prison that he had commanded. And there he found many, many orders signed by Lilakis turning Jews over to the execution squad. Among them, yes, we have, you can see this order uh, turning over Geta Kaplan and her daughter Fruma. Fruma was six years old. And you can see that at the bottom it is signed A. Lilakis. So with this information, OSI was able to prove that Lilakis had participated in persecution and it revoked his citizenship in 1996. About a month later, he Lithuanian officials gave him a passport and he went back to Lithuania with the understanding that he was not going to be tried. But then the United States put tremendous pressure on Lithuanian authorities. So in 1998, they charged him with genocide, but the proceedings dragged out until the Lakers finally died in 2000 at the age of 93. And that was without a verdict, without any resolution. Yes. We would like to give special thanks to our partners and colleagues at the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, former colleagues of Barry's there, Eli Rosenbaum and Susan Masling um, in the U.S. Department of Justice, what is now the Human Rights and Special Prosecution section. They uh, helped us in preparing for this program and shared information. So thank you, Eli and Susan. Now, Barry, those of us who um, follow these kind of prosecutions know that OSI is probably the most effective of any law enforcement agency charged with investigating crimes of this type from the Nazi era. And it has won more cases, correct me if I'm wrong, it has won more cases over the past 40 years than have the government authorities of all of the rest of the countries of the world combined. Is that right? I, I believe that is right. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty amazing because when OSI was founded, almost no one expected it to last long or to have any success. So when I was hired in 1983, I was told that the office would last three to five years at most. Instead, it lasted 31 years, and then its personnel and duties were transferred to the Human Rights and Special Prosecution section, which is still continuing its mission. And the two cases, the two offices have 
brought successful cases against 109 Nazi persecutors and have prevented over 200 suspected Nazi persecutors from entering the United States. OSI's success rate in its cases was over 93%. 93%, uh, that would be the envy of many a prosecutor anywhere in any um, arena of law. And I know it's been really uh, amazing to watch. It's really the, the combination of legal know-how and historical expertise that has proven key to the success of OSI. Now, to this point, we've only been talking about holding perpetrators accountable through legal me measures. Um, courts and legal actions, but is that enough to achieve justice? What are some of the other ways that survivors have sought um, to find some kind of accountability or uh, recompense? Yeah, um, punishing perpetrators is of course important, but that's not nearly enough to get some measure of justice for the victims. I mean, think of it, the Holocaust was not just the murder of six million people, it was also probably the biggest theft in history. So everywhere German forces went, Jews were robbed of literally everything they owned or held dear, their homes, businesses, personal possessions, their places of worship, uh, even their entire communities. I think we have some photos here. Yes, um, showing the synagogue in the Czechoslovak town of Opava in 1938. Um, in its grandeur uh, before the Holocaust and then during its destruction uh, in Kristallnacht in 1938. Oh, and this is a crate full of wedding rings that were taken from Nazi victims. Uh, I think this was found at Buchenwald by US soldiers. So the survivors at the end of the war were left with nothing, no homes to go back to, uh, nothing to help them start living again. And many of them suffered very grave physical and emotional effects from the torture and the trauma that they had endured. So Jewish organizations banded together to advocate for reparations and compensation to help the survivors start new lives. One of the persons involved in that was Ben Ferenz. He was a US immigrant who'd served in the third US army during the war. And at the ripe age of 27 in 1948, he prosecuted one of the 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials. Immediately after that, he went to work trying to get restitution and reparations for Jews in Germany. And he was one of the negotiators to persuade West Germany to pay reparations to survivors in the state of Israel. And uh, Ben remind, remains a dedicated champion in the pursuit of justice. Um, he now at the age of 101 um, has given us a recent interview where he describes the steps that need to be taken to provide ongoing justice for the victims of genocide and mass atrocities. Let's have a listen to Ben. First you end the war, then you provide restitution for the victims, then you're preventing it from happening again. We will not try to put a value on a human life. We will ask for compensation on the normal principles of the law. Compensation is vital. So they know they won't get away with it. They know they're gonna to have to pay through the nose for any wrongdoing, which exists in civil society. So the financial deterrent effect is there, but more important than that, the sense of justice. I'm struck hearing that. It reminds me as a teenager of um, being with my grandmother uh, who would receive a small blue envelope periodically from the West German government containing a reparations check. Um, as I recall, the checks were very small, I think under $100 every quarter or something, but uh, it meant a lot to her. She had three sisters who were murdered, two brothers who were murdered, her parents, her entire extended family, and this little blue envelope uh, could not bring them back, but was an acknowledgement of her loss, it, it felt very, very important. Um, so how successful were these post-war efforts uh, to redress the wrongs that, that victims had suffered in financial terms? Um, in financial terms, not, not very, um, as you say, the reparations were not very generous. Uh, Jews in Western Europe did get help in a resettling, uh, but Jews in, behind the Iron Curtain basically got nothing. 
And it was extremely rare for any survivors to uh, get back anything that they or their families had owned. But with the end of the Cold War, there was new momentum to try to get justice for the survivors, especially for those who've been living behind the Iron Curtain. And those efforts are continuing today. Let's elaborate on that a little bit, actually. We have an audience question from Alejandro who asks, now at nearly 76 years after the end of World War II, how many confirmed Nazi war criminals may still be alive and are being pursued or imprisoned. I know there was a recent case just a couple of months ago here in the United States, right? Yes, uh, two months ago, the Justice Department removed a former Neuengamme concentration camp guard to Germany, which shows the department's continuing commitment to deny safe haven in the United States to perpetrators of Nazi crimes, also of other kinds of human rights abuses. But um, how many are still alive from World War II? Well, you know, not, not very many because any who are still living would be well into their 90s. This man who was removed was 95. So Barry, based on your experience, both uh, working at OSI, but also as a historian, in your opinion, how have the decades of pursuing justice or at least some measure of accountability um, following the Holocaust taught us? How are they instructive in responding to modern day current atrocities? Well, the, the years long efforts of Holocaust survivors to get justice really demonstrate that uh, victims and survivors of genocides and mass atrocities can't expect that justice is something that's going to be provided to them by governments or international organizations. Uh, and so it's really important that like Holocaust survivors, they band together and really push for justice for the wrongs that were done to them. And again, no one knows that better than Ben Ferenz, which is why he founded the Ferenz International Justice Initiative here at the Museum Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide. Just last month, it published a terrific resource for survivors and victims called Pursuing Justice for Mass Atrocities, a Handbook for Victim Groups. And it provides guidance and practical strategies for how victims and survivors can achieve the kinds of justice measures that they need. It also uses examples of what Holocaust survivors accomplished to show that such efforts can be successful but they do require uh, tenacity, creativity, yeah. um, and patience, a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. uh, for viewers who are interested, we will provide links to these Ferenc Initiative resources that Barry mentioned, including the new handbook in the comment section. So please do check there later uh, to follow those links. Uh, in closing, Barry, I'd like to ask you what you think about whether these efforts to pursue justice, um, the, the search for accountability, could these one day have any impact on preventing or mitigating future genocides and future atrocities? Justice is a very important tool of genocide prevention uh, because genocides don't just happen out of the blue. They're almost always preceded by incidents of mass violence targeting groups. And that kind of mass violence is one of the primary risk factors for future genocides. And so justice is very important for breaking that cycle of violence, both by showing that perpetrators will be punished, but also by building institutions that people trust to protect them and treat them fairly so that they won't feel the need to resort to violence. So it's about breaking those cycles as well and giving some sort of um, hope, or as you said, trust that there are systems in place. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you so much, Barry, for joining us today to shed light on this important topic, but even more so for all of your work that you have done to pursue justice for Holocaust victims, survivors, and their families. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I just want to acknowledge the limits of the word justice, that it assumes that somehow things can be put right back together. And we know that after a murder, no one can bring that person back to life. No one can restore the lost childhood or disrupted families or communities, but it's about accountability. It's about acknowledgement. It's about a sense of, of being seen and, and heard. 
Preserving Holocaust history and seeking justice of many kinds for the victims of the Holocaust and for subsequent atrocities was at the heart of the work undertaken by our museum's founding father, Elie Wiesel. Each year, the museum honors his legacy by bestowing the Elie Wiesel Award to individuals and organizations who have advanced the museum's goals of confronting hatred, preventing genocide, and promoting human dignity. This year, the recipients of the Elie Wiesel Award are Ambassador Stuart Eisenstadt, pictured here on the left, and the Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations, led by Eli Rosenbaum, pictured on the right, about whom we learned today. Ambassador Eisenstadt and the OSI have worked tirelessly to secure some measure of justice and accountability for Holocaust survivors, and we are so pleased to give honor to and attention to their work with this year's award. You, our viewers, we are very glad that you were with us today, and we invite you to join us for our next Facebook Live program, same time, same place, in two weeks, on Wednesday, May 5th, at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time here in the U.S. Our program will be about the myth of the perfect mother, propaganda, and conspiracy theories. We will examine how the Nazis manipulated the concept of motherhood and femininity to encourage women and girls to do their part in creating what they termed a pure master race. We'll also talk about how that myth is being exploited today in conspiracy theories that continue to divide society and jeopardize democracy. So we hope you'll be back with us then. Until that time, wherever you are, be safe and healthy, and thank you so much. Bye-bye.